Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Happy Friday. Um, welcome to this event. Um, I'm Becca Parkinson. I am the marketing coordinator at Manchester University Press, the publisher of the book we are discussing today. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, I'm just going to do a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, so firstly, this event is being recorded. But don't worry, we can't see you. You are on mute. Your cameras are off. Please, could we ask you to stay that way so as not to disturb the speakers? Um, if you have a question or a comment, um, we would encourage you to add those in the chat box, which hopefully should be at the side of your screen. Um, lastly, you will receive an email after this event with a discount code to um, buy the brilliant book we're talking about today. We encourage you to do so. Um, that code is valid for a while, so you can do it today, you can do it in a few weeks if you want to, you can buy copies for friends, whatever floats your boat. Um, so without further ado, let's begin the event. Um, I will now hand over to the authors of Ireland and the European Union, Michael Holmes and Catherine Simpson, and today's host, Stephen O'Shea from European Movement Ireland. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Becca, and uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, on behalf of Manchester University Press and European Movement Ireland, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar to mark the publication of Ireland and the European Union Economic, Political and Social Crises, which is edited by Michael Holmes and Catherine Simpson, who join us today. My name is Stephen O'Shea, and I'm the Deputy CEO at European Movement Ireland, an organisation dedicated to developing the connections between Ireland and Europe. And as I mentioned, I'm delighted to be joined by the book's editors and uh, shortly we'll be discussing some key aspects. But first, uh, some introductions. Uh, Michael Holmes is Associate Professor at the European School of Political and Social Sciences in Lille, France since 2020. He previously taught at University College uh, Dublin, University of Limerick and UCC before joining Hope uh, University in Liber Liverpool. And his research has focused on the impact of European integration on political parties. He's also written books, The Irish Labour Party and uh, European Integration, uh, a book on the Irish left and the European Constitution and the European left and the financial crisis. And he also edited an earlier book on Ireland and the European Union, Nice Enlargement and the Future of Europe, which Catherine is uh, showing us all. Mm -hmm. And as a side interest, he teaches a course on, on sport and politics, which uh, I think is not an unnatural alignment. And Dr. Catherine Simpson is a senior lecturer in political econom economy within the Future Econom Economies Research Centre at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. She's also trustee and elected secretary of the Academic Association for Contemporary European Studies and deputy director of the Manchester Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence. And her research focuses on public opinion, political behaviour and attitude, attitudes towards the European Union, in particular in Ireland and the UK in the context of Brexit. She's published her research in world leading academic journals, such as the Journal of European Public Policy, and Irish Political Studies, and is a regular contributor to academic blogs. Catherine's also a regular media commentator on European, British and Irish politics, featuring on a range of local, national and international media and she was the academic commentator on Brexit uh, for BBC Breakfast uh, between 2016 and 2019. We'll begin this morning by asking Michael and Catherine to outline their perspectives on the volume and this will be followed by a discussion and we'll have lots of time at the end for Q&A uh, before finishing up at around 12. So just remind, uh, re remind people again if they have questions just to stick them in the chat uh, box or the chat function and uh, we will uh, endeavour to get to them. Uh, but for now, I think we'll get going. So, uh, Michael, I'll hand over to you first to give your perspectives, and uh, that will be followed by Catherine. Thank you very much, Steve. And, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to be uh, involved in this launch. I can't quite say be here. I'm mean, stuck in my office, as, I, as always. But um, um, uh, And again, I think, you know, it's one of the odd features of the last couple of years is that we've all got so used to doing things online. Um, I, and I'm going to go right back to how this book, this, the idea for this book started, because it shows the value of actually meeting in, meeting up, going to conferences, networking, all of those kinds of things, uh, because it was quite, quite a few years ago where uh, there was a conference taking place in Leeds, if I remember correctly, um, uh, and that's where I was having a conversation with Catherine, and we were sort of saying, oh, you know, there's so much happening in that, in relation to Ireland and the European Union, it's changing, and I said, 
we should do a new book. I mean, having edited the previous book back in 2005, looking at Ireland's relationship with the European Union. And so this entire project stems from that moment, kind of passing conversation almost, uh, uh, it, 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 probably over a coffee in, in Leeds, um, suggesting, well, we should really try and put something together. Uh, um, I think at the time we thought this was going to be a fairly simple project to do. Um, it's a sign of how interesting the topic is that we kept on having to add chapters as new crises unfolded or as existing crises refused to lie down and be quiet. Um, so it was a constant process of trying to work out, okay, where do we call halt? What do we add in? What do we not add in? Uh, but also, a very I hope, a very stimulating uh, analysis of uh, what is going on in terms of the R&D relationship. So, Catherine, I don't know whether you want to kind of comment more on that process of how we managed to then assemble the project. Yes, I mean, well, first of all, thank you very much, Stephen, um, for your kind of kind and comprehensive uh, introduction. And I would also like to thank European Movement Ireland uh, for its support uh, in supporting this uh, book launch, but also throughout my research. It's been a, a standing friend uh, to me. Um, but also to Manchester University Press for publishing the important volume and I really think as well the contributors um, because without whom we really couldn't have put together such a, a brilliant book uh, to be honest. Um, and I think a really special thanks must go to, to my co-editor Michael Holmes um, because you have I have learned so much uh, from this process and it's been a real pleasure working with you and I know we've got another book coming on uh, so we're going to continue that relationship going on but Michael's right the, the, the initial idea for this book uh, came between Leeds and Krakow so back uh, at, at the OASIS annual conference in 2017 um, and again you know the last book to be published on Ireland and the European Union was in 2008 by Bridget Laffin and Jane O'Mahony and then prior to that in terms of edited volumes was Michael Holmes's uh, 2005 edition um, and, you know, since 2008, an awful lot had happened in the Ireland-EU relationship. We'd had the financial and eurozone crisis kind of at the end of 2008 and, and rolling on. We had a number of foreign policy challenges, which, you know, we can see today have still not been resolved. Um, the migration crisis of 2015 and then Brexit in 2016. And one of the key, I think, probably unique selling points of the book um, was the ability to examine a, a really wide range of themes, but in a very comprehensive and cohesive manner. Um, and, you know, it, it was crucial for us to look at these in, from three areas, from a political perspective, from a societal perspective, but also a, a policy perspective. Um, so we organized a panel at the UAC's annual conference in Bath in 2018. We had a two day workshop, which at the time we called Ireland and the EU in a changing world uh, at MMU in 2019. And that brought all the contributors together um, and we kind of workshopped the book. And, and that really was an invaluable source of, of feedback and discussion and debate. Um, as Michael said, there's there's been a whole variety of challenges. The general elections in the UK and Ireland uh, for a start, um, the elastic nature of Brexit negotiations. We've also had the challenge of COVID-19 um, and whether we integrated that within the book and how we, we honoured that. Um, but I really do think the contributors have produced outstanding chapters to really unusual challenges, quite frankly. And I think the diversity of discipl disciplines, but also opinions, um, have produced what I think we think uh, is a very coherent and insightful set of analyses on the Ireland-EU relationship. Um, which I think we're going to discuss a little bit more now uh, in depth. Thanks very much, uh, both Michael and, and Catherine. And um, and I suppose to to get into to some of those crises. And you mentioned uh, the financial crisis, um, which we almost forget about now in terms of its 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 impact and its its, its impact on on people's lives in in, in particular um, was was very serious. Uh, at the time, and I'm I'm struck that you know such such a a, a major crisis or crises um, would have been the perfect Eurosceptic moment uh, for Ireland. Um, and and I'm interested in your perspective. And I might come to you first on it, Catherine. I'm interested on your perspective on why that Eurosceptic moment did not come to pass, and, and why you think that might have been. Yeah. 
you would expect that, you know, at the end, of, you know, <clears throat> with the onset of the financial crisis, the kind of, you know, the the the, the various bailouts in, in several European states. Um, but I, I think it's really, really important to know that the, despite those theories of crisis, in particular the economic crisis, um, that could have actually proved to be kind of a critical juncture in Ireland's EU relationship, that never really happened. And Ireland has still remained very much within Europe. It has never kind of, you know, moved away from it. It's always been a very pro-European member state, public opinion data, um, even from the onset of the financial crisis uh, highlights that. And I'm looking at kind of long-standing uh, opinion polls of things like Eurobarometer data that you know track public opinion over a long time, but also kind of those snapshot polls as well. So kind of European Movement Ireland, for example, the annual poll you guys do. Um, you know, and I think as well with regards to that, that there is a real pro-EU consensus among Irish political parties. And that is a really important thing because it's a recognition that a small member, mem member state of the European Union like Ireland um, benefits from kind of international rules and norms. And there doesn't really, there's no real Eurosceptic political party in Ireland. Um, and, you know, Michael, I'm sure I'll talk about this, at, 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 you know, further, but I think that's why there's been no development of Euroscepticism since the onset of the financial crisis, to the extent you would have expected it in other, you know, and that you saw in countries, say, like Greece and um, Portugal and Italy. That's just not there in Ireland. And I think because of that, Ireland is seen as kind of a good EU citizen. Um, it, it went through the, the economic crisis and the agony of that bailout programme. It very much came out as kind of a poster boy uh, for the resilience and toughing it out. Um, but I think there's an awful lot more to be done on addressing those knowledge gaps on, on, on what, what the EU does for citizens. I think it's not good enough anymore just to see it in that cost benefit analysis. Um, but I'll, I'll bring Michael in for a little bit more on the kind of the Euroscepticism and political parties. Mm. Michael, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, so a lot of my focus has always been on in relation to political parties. And yes, I think it's one of the really interesting features uh, is the extent to which there was kind of a broad consensus. There were some dissenting voices. I think one of the strongest would have come from Sinn Féin. But as we'll be saying later on, when we look a little bit further, um, you know, with the whole Brexit issue, Sinn Féin's position in relation to the European Union has become a great deal more kind of it's critical from within as opposed to critical from without i'll put it that way it's kind of shifted quite distinctly um and so that's kind of again extended this broad consensus uh in ireland i think there's a, there's a really interesting chapter in the book by madeline moore and so Turner, which examines public protest movements um i think an awful lot of the that euro skepticism that critical euro critical voice does exist um it's not really reflected through the political party system um, uh, in the way in which it ended up being done in other countries, again, such as Spain, such as Portugal, such as Greece. Um, so that comparative dimension is a little bit different. Uh, and I think there's perhaps two other broad points to make in relation to why did that happen, the public protests, and why were they not then taken on at the party political level? I think for an awful lot of people in Ireland, there was a kind of a sense that, well, we're not happy with austerity. We're not, you know, there are other options. And I don't think those were ever fully properly explored. Um, they're, they're, there's kind of a very narrow mindset about the right way to solve this issue. Um, but I think there was also a broad acceptance in Irish people that actually Europe didn't create the problem. Um, Irish politicians and Irish business leaders, not all of them by any means, of course, are the ones who are responsible. So we've dug this hole, we've got to try and get out in some shape or form. I think that's one of the factors that um, have weakened that Europe. The, the public resentment becoming a very strong Eurosceptic dimension. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very interesting point because, you know, I remember at the time, you know, there was this sense of, particularly when we entered the programme, there was this sense of, you know, relief is too strong a word, but there was certainly a sense of, you know, this will sort of help us on our way. Now, you know, I don't think that, may have you know lasted throughout uh the, the the three years but in those initial early days there was kind of a um a recognition um uh, that the, the the program held from you know the eu in particular i think who were identified with it at the time um was something that you know 
was going to set us on the right path. Would you would you would you concur with that, Michael, or or is that too simplistic? Um, I think it's a case of people sort of think again. It depends on who you ask about that, um, because right path, wrong path, that depends an awful lot on if you like pre-existing ideological dispositions, interpretations, and so on. So it's the right path if you accept certain certain forms of logic about what needs to be done, how an economy ought to be run. Um, I mean, what I think is interesting in a broader European perspective of trying to interpret the Irish position is the extent to which. Um, uh, you know, Ireland, our Irish political and business leaders, again, have very strongly chosen to identify with, if you like, what's called the Northern model within the European Union. There's a very distinct Southern European model which says, no, Europe should be more about solidarity than about economic stringency and making sure that everything is done in a certain proper way. It doesn't mean that we abandon economic rules, but the rules ought to be a little bit more flexible um, because otherwise you are damaging European Union solidarity. Um, um, so again, I think you know, the way I would interpret Irish political parties is that they tend to favour that idea of the, um, oh yes, so this is how things must be done, kind of financial orthodoxy, economic orthodoxy um, of a certain type. Um, and again, some of those arguments about solidarity within the broader European Union are left a little bit by the wayside. And then just moving just, on. Yeah, sorry, Catherine, yeah. please. Michael, just yeah. very, very slightly on that. I think Michael is absolutely correct from kind of the political party perspective and I suppose the lack of development in Euroscepticism. But when you look at some polling data done in Standard Europe Brometer uh, during that time in the lead up to the crisis, um, and generally speaking, Irish, Irish individuals or citizens um, were a lot more supportive of uh, the European Union seeing them through the crisis than the Irish government. Um, and I think that feeds into to Michael's thought. So again, around trust, um, but also kind of how they view the European Union as well as kind of the economic model. Um, I, I think that feeds into Michael's things as well. So I think you do have to be very careful when you're kind of designing that. But I think that kind of there was there was a a broad consensus among public opinion, but also at the political level as well, about how to handle the crisis and how to manage that, which mitigated the development of Euroscepticism. And, and just to move on maybe to, to another crisis, which probably has not impacted or, us as much um, from an Irish perspective, and that is migration, which was a major uh, crisis for the European Union 2015, 2016, the effects uh, of which in terms of the change of dynamics and, and uh, we're still living with today a crisis you know, that arguably has not been resolved from a from a policy uh, perspective um, I wonder uh, Michael and I might come to you on it uh, first you know obviously our geographical position um, was one of the reasons that that did not impact or has not impacted us as much but are there you know other reasons or other ways that it has affected the Irish EU relationship? Um, I think the migration crisis, is a really, you know, again, it's one which there's a, there's a really good chapter by um, uh, Aideen Elliott in the book examining this in more detail. Um, and again, yes, I mean, Ireland, I think, found it a bit easy to be kind of on the margins, a little bit, uh, you know, sheltered by the rest of what was going on. Um, but I think this is also one of the a really interesting one to try to examine because you know it goes back a little bit to your quest first question about Euroscepticism as well because one of the clear co-associate factors with Euroscepticism tends to be a strong degree of uh, uh, anti-immigrant attitudes and so on and I think again one of the really interesting findings when we kind of examined what was going on was realizing that there were attempts to set up anti-immigrant political movements to contest elections to win seats which got absolutely nowhere, not even local council seat. Um, so, I mean, I think again, it comes back to a slightly different cultural understanding about our international links and our international relations that exist in Ireland. Again, particularly, you know, I think it's possible to, to overemphasize this, but I also think it's, uh, it'd be foolish to completely ignore it. The fact that we are so used to being a country of emigration, um, so we know what it's like to be arriving in a country without perhaps having the court papers, without having access to a job, with all of these kinds of problems that build in around it. And perhaps that gives us a little more of a kind of a cultural sensitivity towards this issue. Um, 
So, I mean, again, that's something which is still, you know, that can change uh, quite easily. These attitudes are never fixed. But um, for the moment, I think that would be one of the factors I would identify uh, looking at this migration issue. And I think just one final point, I think also one thing to keep in mind is that um, as a general issue about the migration crisis, uh, I have no problems using that language, but as I always emphasize to my students over here in France as well when I'm talking about this issue, um, uh, is that, you know, what? What kind of crisis is it? It's often now portrayed as a security crisis of Europe's borders. The wrong people are trying to get in. They're all potentially terrorists. A very negative thing. It's a human rights crisis. Uh, I think that's the fundamental for me. It's a human rights crisis of people who are struggling to live, struggling to survive, whether it's because of conflict or just simply economic underdevelopment. And uh, you know, I think that's one of the elements where we need to be pushing quite strongly, uh, you know, from a, a supportive Irish point of view from that. Catherine, I don't know what 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 your perspective on, on that might be from the from the public uh, perception, public polling perspective, or indeed other perspectives that you may have. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Aidan Elliott, you know, really writes a really comprehensive chapter on this and actually shows that Ireland should have very much stepped up to the plate a lot sooner and has a lot more to do in this area. And I think, you know, I think this will tie in a little bit around, you know, kind of what we'll talk about in following on about security and defence and foreign policy. But I think this policy area will actually become part of that broader framework. And Ireland may find itself, I don't want to say under pressure, but, you know, having to play a lot more of a role in this area um and again kind of you know we have a very very kind of set <clears throat> a very clear kind of political and, and social and, and economic perspective on this but i think it will have to be integrated a lot clearer into public policy um and again a clearer role to play um on this area um moving forward and i think you know current circumstances that we're seeing in europe as we speak i think will bring this a lot more to the fore and I, I'm not convinced that um, there's a very clear strategy on how to deal with this. Um, and I think that's going to be a, a big a big question that Ireland is going to have to grapple with over the next kind of immediate couple of weeks, but also I think months and years ahead. Public opinion is, is very varied on this as well. Um, again, kind of data that I've looked at, you know, very supportive of it in theory, but in practice, not quite sure and i think that would be something that will have to be addressed well let's turn to those events at the moment that you mentioned um, and obviously we are seeing a grave crisis unfold uh, regarding the situation uh, in ukraine um, and this is obviously throwing up uh, serious questions which have been there for a long time about the EU's abilities in the area of foreign policy and defence. Um, you know, the progress and was underway in terms of the defence area and thinking of the strategic compass, which is due before the European Council next month. There have been a lot of movements and discussions in this area over the past year in particular, but probably since the, the, the global strategy in 2016. And I'm just wondering. You know, and I don't know which of you would like to come in on this first, but I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, this being this crisis, uh, which has erupted being, you know, a, a focal point or a milestone uh, in terms of EU foreign policy, uh, security policy and defence, whether you have any perspectives at this point in how that may play out. And obviously there will be implications that we can get into then um, for Ireland's traditional position, uh, uh, particularly in the defence area. So, Michael or Catherine, I don't know if you want to give your perspectives on, on that first, whichever whichever wants to come in. I'll let Michael go first. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, first of all, a bit of background on this. I mean, obviously, what we were trying to do with the book was to look at a whole series of crises that were affecting the European Union. So, we wanted to look at the foreign policy dimension. I think one of the interesting features was the, the, the sense which Whilst for a lot of other European countries, there was a very important foreign policy challenge, whether it's the 
again, sort of the, the succession of previous crises in Eastern Europe, again, particularly involving the Ukraine with the Crimea situation, with the, um, the destabilization of uh, Ukraine's eastern border and so on, um, uh, and these types of challenges, or whether, again, it's the wider kind of regional challenges of you know, what happened in Syria, uh, um, and again, the stabilization of the conflict there. Um, I, I think the, the sense of the analysis that, that emerges in the book was that um, these were not seen as being very central to, a, to an Irish point of view. So the current crisis is obviously in Ukraine is one that is, is much more of a shock, much more of a challenge as to, as to how we go about addressing it. Um, again, whether I, I, it's it's really interesting to try to see what is happening here, um, because there's three different elements. There's there's an element of going right back to great power politics. I, I have to admit, I, relatively recently, I just finished reading in the last couple of weeks. I finished reading um, the really interesting book Sleepwalkers about the about how World War One began. So I keep on sort of as I was reading that, and as the situation is deteriorating, and we started getting France and Britain talking with Russia and and Germany being involved. It, it was reminding me of some of what I was reading in Sleepwalkers about how World War One began. Great power rivalry playing out in a certain way. And that was something that was kind of sidelining the European Union um, uh, in terms of what we're looking at. Whether the European Union has a significant role to play um, or whether it is allowed to play that role um, is perhaps even more important. I mean, it's very clear I think, that um, President Putin does not particularly wish to engage with the European Union. Uh, it's also quite clear that President Biden prefers to sort of make this a NATO issue led by the United States and so on. And it clearly also does make the UK role so it makes it again particularly hard for a European Union position to try to to a coherent one to emerge in relation to this. I think from I've only had a chance to glance briefly at what emerged from the uh, the, the, the meeting yesterday. Um, it does appear to be a really coherent set of um, uh, of uh, sanctions being introduced for the moment within the European Union context, but whether anything can work, I don't know. Yeah, and I think I think that that point about sanctions is interesting because. There is a, 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 a series of, of very comprehensive sanctions, I think, emerging this morning. There's some controversy over whether uh, the this, this, this SWIFT uh, kicking Europe out of this or kicking Russia out of the SWIFT mechanism um, um, will or will not arrive. But I mean, it seems to me that Europe, the EU is, you know, almost completely reliant on the sanctions mechanism on its economic power uh, in terms of responding to the situation um, that is emerging. And, you know, whether that reliance on economic power is something that calls into question uh, the other powers that it may have at its uh, disposal in terms of, or lack of, in terms of uh, security and defence, particularly in new areas of security and defense, you know, cyber, um, you know, misinformation, disinformation, all of those emerging areas in, in, in defense, um, I think it would be interesting to see how that, you know, plays out on, on, a, on a European level over, over, the next, uh, over the next months. And Catherine, I, I don't know if you have, you know, perspectives then, I'm sure you do, on how that trickles down and impacts, um, you know, the very particular situation uh, in Ireland. I think it's, you know, Ben Tonner writes, a, a, again, a, a really good chapter on this. I mean, Ben is, you know, I'm certainly not a, a security and defence expert, but his chapter is, is really, 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 really good on this. And I think one of the things that came out to me um, when you're kind of seeing the book all together is that a public debate on security, defence and foreign policy is very much needed in Ireland. And, and how and what type of co a cooperation with the European Union will look like. Now, this has been going on for quite some time, but I think, you know, the EU has been a little bit paralysed by Brexit. As a consequence of that, then it's also been tied up with COVID-19 and acceleration of health policy. And security and defence has never really been front and centre. And it's also been, from an Irish perspective, a very kind of sensitive topic. You know, you go back to the Nice Treaty referendum in 2001, uh, again, kind of, you know, and, and looking at the narrative that was constructed around there about kind of creating a European army, it then reared its head again it, under the Lisbon Treaty in 2007. So this is something um, that I think is, you know, is a sensitive area because it's it's so central to 
national sovereignty, national security, etc. But I think as well, and you know, when you're talking about some of the the newer forms of security, you know, you talked about cyber security. You know, Ireland has seen firsthand how devastating that can be. Um, you know, you look at the cyber attack on the HSC last year, for example, um, and you know, polling data as well. Seventy percent, approximately, of people believe there should be the should the EU should do a lot more to regulate digital media platforms. So again, that's talking about online news, information, sharing platforms, social media, that kind of thing. So there is strong support on this. That support as well doesn't really translate to kind of the normal or traditional aspects of security. And I think that's where the public debate really needs to come. And it will definitely, most undoubtedly, be accelerated given the current circumstances uh, of what we have seen. And from an EU perspective as well, you know, the EU26 offered extraordinary support for Ireland during Brexit negotiations. Um, and while there's no explicit quid pro quo, there may be an implied expectation that Ireland shows a greater solidarity on issues where it's been a little bit of an outlier in the past. Um, and I think that's where the public debate on security and defence needs to come. Um, and I think that's where Ireland may see a little bit of pressure. I think probably kind of sooner rather than later, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and sorry, Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Just to chip back in on a couple of points in relation to that, actually, because um, I mean, first of all, you know, uh, I don't think the European Union is not going ahead with deeper security cooperation because of Ireland. If they had really wanted to do this, it would have happened ages ago. Ireland is not blocking anything. Ireland has always been very supportive on this and has always been said, oh, we'll, we'll sort something out, don't worry. So that's not an obstacle. Um, I fully agree that you know the European Union needs to maybe think a little bit more about security issues, but I put that in a very broad sense. If you think about you know, security from the point of view of health. Um, uh, as being a much more, you know, uh, so, you know, I'm here to see debates in Ireland about the development of staunch care and so on, a proper kind of universal health system. That's one of the areas of security we also need to be, be thinking about. And Stephen, you started out with kind of comment about sort of the, um, you know, the European Union is, you know, it's, it's good at the economic stuff. Of course it is. It's an economic community at its absolute heart. It's those, those broader things. But again, the European Union does not have a European army and does not have a defence and security, a full defence and security component by accident, it's by intent. Most of the member states either, well, most of them really would rather have a NATO as the framework. Um, so again, that's always going to be one of, the, one of the, the hazards for the European Union. It has to learn how to balance what it wants to do alongside what NATO, uh, you know, the, the very strong adherence to NATO for many countries. And that brings in a whole different set of issues and different set of challenges. And I'm, 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 I'm interested uh, in, the public debate uh, around defence aspect, Catherine, that, that you raised as well, um, because and the aligned to the solidarity uh, um, aspect, because I think we have seen in terms of, you know, I was going to come to this a little bit later, but I might just ask you a question on it now, is in terms of the non-crisis, if you like, of corporation tax, uh, which, um, um, which you know, was potentially an area um, where, you know, there could have been a divergence of interest uh, between Ireland and, and the European Union. And that was managed, I think, um, um, on both sides quite successfully and quite transparently through a sort of an ongoing, you know, media messaging, communications. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, is that perhaps the, the the format that ultimately we may uh, follow in terms of the develop the defence realm and aligning with uh, developments that may happen there at a European level. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's certainly it's it's certainly been a successful model because again, if you look at referendums in or EU related referendums in the past in Ireland, corporation tax again has been kind of very highly tied with national you know. Um, nationalism and sovereignty and all of those kind of you know hard state uh, state qualities um, but actually the corporation tax didn't really feature as strongly when it was being reviewed as, as maybe I think a lot of people would have now and again I mean you know I think that may be a model to uh, kind of for you know use 
moving forward um, when we're trying to tackle some of these more sensitive issues like security and defence. Um, so I think, that, you know, I, I also think as well that there's still, there's still quite, there are still issues there in the Irish EU relationship that are highly sensitive that still need to be resolved. I think that's one of them. Taxation, you know, we've, we've maybe dealt with the corporation tax, but taxation, taxation more broadly, I think, will come into it. Um, and again, I'm not quite sure how that is going to be um, and how that will look like. But certainly the kind of more cooperative and more kind of the, what we have seen so far has been, say, a good, good successful model. Um, and public opinion seems to be a little bit more dialed down on this as well. And I wonder, is that a legacy of, um, you know, the financial crisis as well? And maybe kind of how supportive the European Union ha has been throughout that uh, and how attitudes were at that time and kind of almost a maybe giving back kind of a responsibility. So kind of, you know, not quite quid pro quo, but certainly, you know, going along those lines. Um, Michael, about the corporation tax. what? What were your thoughts uh, about how kind of the model would be? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's. I mean, you can already see that there's a lot. There's been a lot of pressure in relation to this. Um, there have been the, the new arrangements being put in place, which I think. Uh, I mean, my my own stance on this. I think there's a really interesting chapter, by the way, by Sheila Killian in the book, mm -hmm. uh, looking in great detail at the, the whole corporation tax issue. An excellent chapter there. Um, I mean. Uh, with my French students here, uh, anytime anything about corporation tax comes up, they list the tax haven tax cheat countries, and Ireland is always included. No question about that here. Um, so, um, uh, and I think it comes in. I mean, for, for me, the taxation issue again rolls over beyond just simply an issue about tax and what we do with it. It's also an issue about solidarity within the European Union. And, and if I can just give one very quick anecdote, and it's going back to my time when I was based in Liverpool, uh, I would, of course, carefully listen to Irish radio news this morning. And one day I switched on and said, this is the high, still at the height of the Celtic Tiger period. Another joyous announcement on the news about an American company setting up in Ireland, 200 new jobs, blah, 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 blah. And then I picked up the newspaper on my way into to work in Liverpool. And as I was reading through it later on in the morning, I saw a little note sort of saying, American company, out of Scotland to move to Ireland because they're getting huge tax benefits, oh, and 300 jobs being lost. So it's going from 300 jobs in Scotland to 200 jobs in Ireland, presumably with a big chunk of tax money to support them as well. From a European Union point of view, that was kind of 100 jobs being lost by internal competition in a bad way. Uh, so that's where kind of those issues of solidarity, I think, are very important about how these things are perceived and understood as well. Well, we'll stick with the issue of solidarity and come to uh, Brexit, which we uh, uh, I think we're 40 minutes in and we're only returning to it now. Um, whether that's a good or a bad sign, I'm not sure. But before I, I, I turn to that, I just might remind people if they have questions just to uh, stick them in the chat and we'll come to them uh, shortly. I suppose Brexit, you know, threatened to be an existential crisis for both the European Union and from an Irish perspective as well. Um, and you know, my sense that, I suppose, from that Irish perspective, in the Republic anyway, um, you know, some of the, you know, major potential impacts that were identified prior have been mitigated to a certain extent, particularly, you know, maybe in, in, in the economic sphere, there is an all-island perspective, obviously, that is far more destabilizing. Um, but... I and, and it's funny because we're doing uh, European Movement Ireland are doing conference on the future of Europe citizens panels around the country at the moment, and I've been struck from those um, um, uh, that Brexit is, is not coming off as much as you know we might have thought it would two or, or three years ago, and um, so I'm just wondering, um, Mike, I might go to you on that first. You know, is it? Is it a crisis that has passed, or is there more to come, um, um, particularly in terms of the EU-UK future relationship, but also, and we'll, we'll turn to the All-Ireland perspective maybe a bit more in a second, but, you know, is Brexit the crisis that keeps on giving? <laughs> Well, I suppose I should point out, first of all, it gave one thing, which, um, you know, I, I am a Brexit refugee. That's one of the reasons I'm in France now, so uh, uh, escaping from the United Kingdom. Uh, but, um, yeah, um, 
uh, I certainly don't think it's settled um, by any means, um, uh, partly because it takes an awfully long time to disentangle a country from the European Union and then to put in place whatever follow-up relationship is going is is desired on both sides. I think this is going to be something that, that will just rumble on and on and on for quite some time. Um, uh, so whether it is whether from an Irish point of view, um, I think it's it's fair to say that it's been it's been if you like a good as good a Brexit as we could have hoped for. Uh, I think Brexit was very damaging for a lot of relationships with the Ireland. That's very clear, very evident. Um, I think again, the European Union has been very supportive of this. Um, I would have been astonished had they not been. Um, again, I think there was a kind of a sense of we, we try to stick together. There are obviously disagreements within a family, but we're a family, so we try to we try to stick together um, uh, in terms of how these things happen. Um, so yes, I mean, I think there are still. Uh, the, the short-term perspective in terms of what's happened is, from an, from the point of view of Ireland, would be that we've actually come out of this possibly well. Uh, reorientation of trade routes, or kind of you know benefiting from uh, certain certain ones of the arrangements that have been put in place. So that has been a positive thing for the country. Um, of course, that also depends on what set of interests we talk about. I mean, I know we're going to get on to talking about the kind of the all islands dimension. So you know, it has seriously destabilised Northern Ireland. Um, I hope not in too serious a way, but nonetheless, we can see that a lot of the tensions that were gradually, not perfectly, abating there have risen back up towards the surface. So, the surface. so that is, still remains one of the big challenges. I think it would be foolish to say that Brexit is sorted. It's not. Catherine, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've loads to say on this because uh, it's, it's right up my street, to be honest. Um, I mean, there's, there's three there's three excellent chapters on Brexit and, and looks at uh, look at this uh, by David Finnamore and Lisa Clare Witten looking at kind of the, the Northern Ireland perspective. Jonathan Everstead looks at how it's kind of reconstitutionalized and or um, kind of the whole aspect of, of Ireland and Northern Ireland relations, but also with the British. And then Bridget uh, Laffin and Jane O'Mahony look at British Irish relations. And I think, you know, one of one of the things that I'm exceptionally proud of is the book is that we we bring in that Northern Ireland dimension, which has never really been done before. And I think the other thing about about Brexit is that there's it's it's two fronts. There's the economic element and there's the political. Um, and I think Michael has alluded to that a little bit as well. And you know, if you take the example for Northern Ireland, I mean, the immediate challenge for Northern Ireland has been political. It has been very politicised. You know, and you know, it was Northern Ireland never ever featured. Uh, in the lead up to e the EU referendum. I mean, it it is absolutely no exaggeration to say that it was never considered. Um, and then all of a sudden on the back of that result, you know, the you had increasingly um, ambiguous and, and, and also political di discourse around the union, the border, constitutional integrity, things that never would have kind of were kind of seen as sewn up and dealt with. Um, under kind of the the 1998 agreement, Good Friday Agreement, that's that was what it is. So it's really, really changed with that. And you also think as well that from a Northern Ireland perspective, between 2017 and 2020, there was no devolved government in Stormont. Now I don't think that you know the three-year hiatus can be blamed uh, on that, and and the kind of the disagreements and, and Brexit can be blamed on that, but it certainly didn't help because you know it exasperated those tensions. Uh, and it really did serve as kind of a, a disincentive to return to power sharing. And you see what has happened in the last couple of weeks and months. That is still being very much there. The Northern Ireland Protocol is still very front and centre. But you look at public opinion data on how the protocol is being implemented and how it's impacting the daily lives of, of individuals in Northern Ireland. It's really very, very different to the political perspective. Um, and I think so in, in that way, you know, political debate in Northern Ireland is going to be reconstitutionalised by Brexit. There is absolutely no doubt about that. The litmus test for that will be the Assembly elections uh, in, in the next couple of months in May. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's a, maybe at a slightly slower pace, uh, kind of south and, 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 and west of the border. Um, I think you know Dublin has a is a little bit slower on kind of how it's going to look, you know, on, on that all island perspective. 
because at the moment for no, for obvious reasons it's being looked at in economic terms but are we going to see that in a, a, do we need to start thinking about it in political terms realistically from a policy perspective so I, I certainly don't think Brexit is over I think there's much much more to come um, for, for Ireland for Northern Ireland and also for British Irish relations but I think the most important thing when we're now looking at Brexit is that we need to we need to try and take out the political and we need to focus on the practicality of it um, because I think, you know, it has been highly emotive and I, I don't think it's actually been very helpful um, in trying to actually make progress on how we deal with it and how we work is, is kind of with our nearest neighbour um, for, for the better of everyone, really. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, Michael, please, yeah. Yeah, just, just very briefly to, to add a couple of points on that. I mean, first of all, just for the sake of completeness, there's another two chapters in the book about Northern Ireland. So Jamie Powell and Giada Lagana, both of them kind of looking actually at very specifically the peace dimension uh, and the implications there. But I'm going to go back to the very start of, you know, the, what we considered the overview of our book about the Irish-EU relationship. Uh, because, you know, I start out, Stephen, your first question was about kind of, you know, why was there no rise of Euroscepticism, certainly amongst the political parties. And I think one of the interesting features to my mind is that whatever Euroscepticism might have been starting to percolate as a result of the financial crisis, dissipated very strongly with the Brexit effect, particularly amongst the political parties. Again, this is where Sinn Féin, who had always been much more critical, suddenly starts sort of saying, right, now we see a benefit to this. Um, and I think there's a wider game that they're playing as well. But I mean, you know, I think that's it's an interesting perspective there. So if we look at the these are probably the two major crises of the Irish EU relationship over the last 15 years, uh, not wanting to kind of play down too much the migration, foreign policy crisis, and so on. Um, and I think it was a kind of an instant juxtaposition that one was kind of push drawing Ireland a bit more towards the Eurosceptic discourse to some extent, but I think Brexit then gets rid of an awful lot of that. So singles two and juxtaposition is quite important. And that actually brings us nicely to where the book ends up, which is the proposition of nationalism in internationalism, which which uh, both of you outline, and and you know you, you say that you know to date Irish and EU interests have broadly aligned, um, and there has been you know no you know tensions at different times, but I suppose overall the tension between Irish and EU interests um, have been you know, fairly limited to date. And I suppose, you know, what I wrote on my, when I made a note of that, uh, from reading that chapter, I wrote but and a question mark. Um, so I suppose what I want to explore now is the but. Is there, is, you know, what is what is coming over the hill potentially um, that would, or what, what do you envisage could lead to a divergence in those interests? And actually maybe you, you might want to, to start by outlining in in uh, in more lucid terms your your uh, your nationalism and internationalism uh, proposition so um i let whoever wants to to jump there come in first michael do you want to go in okay i, I mean i'll start <laughs> just as a, you know, briefly in terms of the nationalism and internationalism idea i mean uh, it's not the only way of thinking about the irish EU relationship but i think it is you know, and i also wouldn't confine it to just the irish dimension i think that's an it's an interesting issue and challenge for many countries. How do they balance national interests, national concerns inside a shared area of sovereignty? Um, so I think every country should try to find uh, its, its own way of trying, to, uh, of trying to do that. And I think, again, to my mind, one of the most important features about this is that um, I don't see nationalism as a fixed, permanent, easily identified thing. It is, it is, you know, there's so much literature about nationalism in general, which says that it is something that is, you know, it's uh, it's invented, it's reinvented on a regular basis. The famous phrase by Ernest Renan about uh, the reinvention of nationalism on a, you know, on a daily, a national pedestal on a regular basis. You get the ideas of um, Benedict Anderson again, the other, very, another very famous writer in this about the imagined community. Uh, so, um, from that point of view, you know, what, what we try to suggest is that nation, Irish nationalism has gone through a reinvention uh, over quite some period of time in order to better align itself with what's going on within the European Union. But we also think, and I think part of this is that the European Union is also learning how better to align itself with this multiplicity of nations within it and different national perspectives. Uh, it's not a one-way process. It is actually a genuine engagement. 
I think it's one of the positive features about the European Union. I think as well, just to, to, to add on to what Michael says, you know, people feeling more green post-Brexit, um, but yet still being very international in their outlook, you know, that's a juxtaposition straight away. So I think one of the things that is really, really clear from the book and what we'll explore in, in our, our next one is that the pro-EU consensus in Ireland is very much an Irish nationalist one. But what we mean by this is that the EU is viewed with approval because it provides the benefits and, and helps Ireland advance those interests. Um, but we think now there's kind of a more questioning dimension to the relationship, but the same broad out, outlook and pro-EU stance remains. So it's how you can be nationalist, but still be European and still be internationalist in your outlook. And I, I think one of the things I was, I was really, really keen for the book not to be was a book on Brexit. You know, that, you know, we, the, we were because it's, it's not it's looking at things so much more than that. Um, but obviously, you know, within this context of the nationalism and internationalism, you know, Brexit has kind of been at a critical juncture in that it has um, changed relationships between Northern Ireland, you know, Ireland, uh, Britain ways we still don't know how that's going to happen um but i also think the eu is still changing you know from the flip side um there's all you know there's emerging calls for deeper european integration um generally ireland is very supportive of further integration but you know things around like we've talked about already defense uh, tax harmonization could be you know issues and problems that ireland has to tackle while you know while while you know supporting that deeper integration um, but also the global situation is, is constantly evolving. We're looking at things like climate change, health security, uh, deglobalization. So again, they could have an impact on Irish EU relations. And I think it's about how that nationalist outlook and that Irish nationalism positions itself within, within those kind of three um, areas um, and kind of in the context, say, of the EU relationship. Okay. Well, can Michael, please, yeah. Just very briefly, one of the other things that strikes me again, particularly just at the moment, given the, the Ukraine situation, um, I think one of the interesting features is again how internationalism is evolving and the whole kind of literature that exists around the idea of liberal internationalism, I suppose one of its basic precepts is that if you develop economic cooperation, it's going to be impossible for countries to go to war with each other. And essentially, that was for a long time, it's been German policy towards Russia. Okay, we're discovering the limits of that one country are quite prepared to say, well, we don't care too much about the economic dimension. If we want something, we'll get it. And that's not just Russia, that's also our relations with China um, uh, for, for every state. So we're seeing some of the limits of internationalism and need perhaps to reinvent some of that, as well as changing context for nationalism as well. well that's probably a, a brings us to a, a good time to, so we are approaching 50 years of membership um referendum uh, the 50th anniversary of the referendum is coming up this may and uh the 50th anniversary of, of accession in, on the first of of january and um, and so i i just wonder uh, maybe from both of you it might be nice to get any reflections you have on that 50-year journey and how they might in I won't ask you to predict the next 50 years but but how 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 those lessons or reflections might you know inform the future relationship uh, between Ireland and Europe as maybe this is the you know maybe this is the opening chapter for the next book um uh, but but any kind of lessons or reflections you may have from the last 50 years that that uh, that you think may inform the relationship as we begin the next 50. Um, so I, I will again let whichever of you wants to uh, wants to come in, in first on that. Okay, you go first this time. I'll, I'll, I'll go first this time. Um, I, I suppose the first thing I would say is that, you know, EU membership shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, and I think with that, the positive um, outcomes we see in public opinion data and polls shouldn't also be taken for granted because this all feeds into policy areas. So, you know, we've seen this through a variety of, of negative referendum results in, in Ireland, but also in the context of Brexit. And I think that's the first thing is that EU membership shouldn't be taken for granted, but we also need to ensure that we are closing that knowledge gap 
because just because public opinion in Ireland is supportive of the EU does not mean that Irish people are highly informed on EU affairs. And I don't think it's strong enough and good enough anymore to say that, um, you know, it's a good economic project, so let's go with it. Because it's just not, it's so much more than that. Yes, at the heart of it, it is an economic pro project, but it is far more than that. And we need to ensure that everybody and people are well informed uh, on what the EU actually does and what it stands for. Um, and I think really that the other thing I would say as well, that, you know, important issues facing individuals are both economic and policy oriented. And I think if you begin to um, inform uh, individuals a lot more about what things do, those kind of both issues would start then to to be tackled. Um, and I think they would be my two main kind of takeaway home gap, gaps is about not taking EU membership for granted, but closing the knowledge gap is an absolute must um, because we have seen what can happen when you get low levels of knowledge or even incorrect knowledge um, on, on the European Union and what it stands for. Michael. Um, what do I foresee for the next 50 years in Europe? I'll be quite happy if there's a couple of more European Cups for Liverpool to begin with. Anyway, that's, that's a somewhat different issue. Um, but more specifically, let me actually go back. You know, let me let me just pose it in terms of the preceding the 50 years that we've almost got through at this stage and the counterfactual had Ireland not joined what situation would the country be in um I don't think Ireland had an awful lot of choice um so to have remained isolated would have been a bad move now that does not mean that the European Union is necessarily perfect necessarily ideal it's a political construction every political construction involves political Tugs of a uh, 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 tug of war over what direction it goes in. Uh, people have different different perspectives about what needs to be done. Um, so you know, I think we need to be conscious of that. That uh, remaining in glorious isolation would not have been a um, an intelligent policy approach. Um, what type of European Union should we be trying to encourage to build? Um, uh, OK, that's going to depend upon different points of view. That becomes, an, again, if you put, put it this way, an ideological political question. Um, you know, my other area of research is looking at left-wing parties and European integration. I've gone from social democratic left to the more radical left. Um, and I keep on reading documents by them and hearing by these people sort of saying, you know, another Europe is possible. We must reform Europe. Um, fine, but I don't see much of an agenda about how you achieve that, what it exactly means, but I think it is coming back. If Europe remains purely a, um, a market project, it is a bit limited. It needs, again, to develop something broader than that, a political and social dimension to what it is going to do. And I've used the word already, solidarity, a few times. Uh, I mean that between EU countries, but within European Union countries as well. Um, uh, so, you know, that's a much more challenging vision uh, about how you go about achieving it. Um, but uh, I would hope to see some sort of development from that point of view. Thank you very much. And uh, that, unfortunately, um, is all we have time for. So I'd like to, to thank uh, Michael and Catherine for their time and insights, and also to the team at Manchester uh, University Press for organising today's event. Uh, thank you for joining. And finally, don't uh, forget to get your copy of the book, uh, Ireland of the European Union. Uh, economic, social and political crisis, which is available now from uh, Manchester University Press. And um, so once again, thank you very much and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you very much, thank Stephen. You. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.